Hello and welcome to this introduction to digital communications systems. Here we have a diagram that shows how we get from our microphone to our speaker if we are considering this as an audio digital system. For the source, we can have several different inputs. We can have a file from a hard drive. We can have a video uh, picture. We can have audio. And on the output, which is marked the sync, that's just a terminology that we use for the mathematical model. But basically, your sync or information sync would be your screen, your speaker, or another remote uh, file, hard drive file or flash file. And this would also be the way your internet functions as well. And let us analyze the individual blocks quickly so that you would have some appreciation for what they do. The channel, of course, is the long distance, which can be either a long wire line, a microwave radio link, or it could be a fiber optic cable that brings the internet into your house. As I've already said, your sources would usually be audio, video, or data. Now, if you're dealing with audio, which is always analog, you will need to have an analog to digital converter to convert that to bits and bytes. You learned about analog to digital converters in Digital Electronics 2. Your video might require an analog to digital converter depending on whether it is old-fashioned videotape or video camera or whether it is a modern digital camera. If you're dealing with a file, a computer file, it's already in digital format, so it does not require an analog to digital converter. On the output side of things, your loudspeaker is an analog device to reproduce, so you will always need a digital to analog converter to convert your digital stream back to an analog signal that could drive your loudspeaker. Your display screen might or might not need a digital to analog converter. If your display screen is one of the older CRT televisions, then it would require an analog signal. If it is an LCD or LED TV or plasma, then it can probably handle the digital without any need to convert it to analog form. If you're going to save the information that has come across your channel, the data, onto a file, then it does not need a digital to analog converter because it is already digital. But what we see from this page is that whatever goes across our channel is going to be digital. So whether we need to convert it back to analog or convert it from analog, it is a digital communication system and what is going across is bits and bytes. Now, the next thing is the encoder on the input side and the decoder on the output side. And these are grouped together so that they perform opposite functions of each other. The encoder takes your bits that are coming in and it looks to see how it can reduce them. If you have uh, streams of bits in there, that are redundant, it can remove them and create a shorter screen. So this is shorter stream. So this is inherently compression. This is a similar type of function that you would use in a zip file on your hard drive or 
a JPEG file for pictures. It squashes down the amount of data that's required to reproduce your voice or your picture or whatever it is. So this part removes data from your actual digital stream. And the second part of the encoder may add in additional information so that errors in your data can be recovered at the other end. These two functions all fall under the title encoder, but sometimes the compression part is referred to as a source encoder, and the part that adds the redundant error correction information is referred to as a channel encoder. Now, on the decoder side of things, we have to put back the redundant information that was removed. We know how to do this because we're running an algorithm that's easily able to reconstruct the information. This would be similar to expanding your zip file so that it comes back to its original size and we can use it. And the other job, of course, of the decoder is to correct errors that might have happened during the transmission channel as the information was passed through the channel. Errors might have crept in. Bits might have been switched. And there we can get the information back completely if we have included enough redundancy in the original signal that we can perform error correction. Once again... The encoders and decoders have to be compatible so that the type of error correction that we're using on the encoder side matches the type of error correction that we're using on the decoder side. Now we look at the modulator and demodulator aspect of it. The modulator places the information we're trying to transfer, which is data. So we use the terms data and information synonymously now. The data or information that we're trying to transfer across the channel has to be put on a suitable carrier. The carrier could be light or radio waves or an electric current in a wire, depending on the nature of the channel. So, why do we need a carrier? Well, clearly, you know that in the old days, they used to wrap a little note and put it on a pigeon foot. And the pigeon used to fly through the air and carry the message, and somebody would reach out and grab the pigeon and get the message back from the pigeon. They were called homing pigeons for a reason. They knew where to go. Well, the pigeon acted as the carrier. The only pigeon job was to fly through the air and get the message from one place to the next. That's what the carrier does when we are transmitting across the planet or out into space to spacecraft. The carrier is a radio wave in that case. That's why we call it a radio wave. And that carries our information from one place to the next. The demodulator, on the other hand, gets back our data by stripping off the carrier because the carrier, whether it's a radio wave or whatever the carrier happens to be, is not the data. That's what carried the data from one point to the next. So you get rid of the carrier and recover the data in the demodulator. Finally, we look at the channel itself. The channel is the is what the information flows through to get from one place to the next. As we said, it could be a copper wire. It could be an optical fiber to give you higher speeds in your internet in your house. Or it could be a radio wave, in which case it can go across large distances or even out into space to the spaceships waiting up there. So the radio waves is how we would tend to communicate over very long distances, even out of the solar system. But in the world, we operate with optical fibers now, which are much faster than copper wire. And we're soon going to learn why. But whenever the information and the carrier that on which it is riding enters the channel and travels through the channel, noise can corrupt the data. 
Now, the noise is worse in radio systems and least in optical systems. Optical systems have the best noise immunity. That's another reason why they're so incredibly fast. But the radio waves are particularly subject to noise. The longer the channel is and the more space over which they have to fly, the more likely they are to experience interference and noise. Now, analog systems, just by comparison to the digital systems we're learning about, require large amounts of power to overcome this noise, a powerful transmitter so that the noise doesn't render the transmission useless. But in digital communications, we can recover from errors that may have corrupted the information using mathematical algorithms, which we're going to learn about in this course. Perfect data using less power means lower cost, smaller size. You know how small your cell phones are now. They were much bigger before. Longer battery life because we don't have to use up the charge so fast. A green footprint. They're more energy efficient. They generate less heat. And wouldn't we want all of that? We definitely do. This is why we digital communication systems have become so incredibly important. But we have to also realize that we still need to know about analog because most modulators and demodulators are hybrid systems using both analog and digital technology. Sine waves is the basis for all life on this planet. Sine waves is the wave that you learned about when you learned about sine and cosine back in your early days as a child. And the sine wave is still around, and it's the most efficient carrier known. We will learn why in later courses. So this carrier of sine waves can be used across all the channels. Digital baseband signaling, which uses no carrier at all, is very simple to implement, but it is not the most efficient use of the channel bandwidth. We can send so much more information so much quicker. Remember, maximum information as fast as possible is the way the world is going today. So the digital baseband signal is not even possible for radio channels. So whenever it is used, it is used in wires, or perhaps in limited fiber optic use. But even the fiber optic channels that bring your internet right into your house do not use digital baseband signaling now. So, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you in the next video.